Welcome to section one of psychiatry. In this section, we will be discussing infant deprivation, child abuse, child neglect, and vulnerable child syndrome. So let's get started. This is the psychiatry overview figure, which will appear in most of the lectures within psychiatry. It's useful because it shows the timing and duration of most psychiatric illnesses. In this lecture, we'll be focused on child abuse and neglect, starting with infant deprivation of affection, which you can see there. This slide lists the four conditions we're going to discuss in this video. And again, starting with infant deprivation of affection. Then we'll discuss child abuse, child neglect, and vulnerable child syndrome. Now, in these last three conditions, you may have noticed that they're not on that psychiatry overview figure that I previously showed you. And that's because timeline is not critical in the workup of these conditions. But timing is important in infant deprivation of affection. So let's dive into that now. Just a quick definition, an infant is a child under the age of one, so less than a year old. And deprivation means something that's essential, the child's not getting. And in this case, we're referring to the deprivation of affection. To understand why this pathology is significant, you need to know that infants have a physiological and psychological need for affection. So let's talk about the effects of this deprivation of affection. First, infants who have suffered this can develop reactive attachment disorder later. So the child can be withdrawn, sad, or fail to be comforted when upset. They just kind of close off a little bit. And they can have a difficult time developing trust. Also, it can be manifest as failure to thrive. And there can be poor language and social development. So it can be difficult for the child to converse and have appropriate language. And they may actually have disinhibited attachment to strangers, which is an example of poor social development. Now, it's important to recognize that infant deprivation of affection is different than child neglect. Infant deprivation of affection refers to a lack of affection versus a lack of basic needs, which is, of course, referring to physical needs. Now, infant deprivation can result in problems seen throughout childhood and adult life. If deprivation is longer than six months, it is likely that the negative impacts will be permanent. And these are manifest as psychiatric problems. And in extreme cases, although the cause is not completely understood, infant deprivation of affection can result in death. Okay, now that we've covered infant deprivation of affection, let's dive into child abuse. Now, there's a lot of information that you need to know about child abuse significantly more than you need to know about these other three conditions. So to help you consolidate all of that information, we have a table. This table will help us compare and contrast the typical findings, abuser demographics, and important epidemiological facts that are associated with each type of child abuse. So let's start by discussing physical child abuse. With physical child abuse, there are some physical clues that can be useful. For example, burns and bruises. Those should definitely raise alarm for child abuse. Let's dive into burns and bruises a little bit more on this slide. So there are two main things to keep in mind as it relates to burns and bruises, locations and patterns. When it comes to locations, remember the acronym 104. This will help you remember torso, ears, and neck folds, which you need to watch out for in children less than four years old, 104. Now for patterns, this is fairly intuitive because you're seeing well-defined marks from a specific object. And of course, that's a red flag for abuse. For example, the pattern of a buckle, a board, a spatula, a stick or whip, a grid, a cigarette butt, and an immersion pattern. The immersion is referring to being immersed in scalding water, like as though the child was forcibly placed in a really hot bath. Here is a visual representation of these patterns. So belt buckle, a board or spatula, a stick or whip, a grid, cigarette, and immersion. Those are all indications of a specific violent tool that's been used to hurt the child. Lastly, there's another possible cause of unexplained bruising, and those are called Mongolian spots. They occur in young children, but they're really just a patch of colored pigment that didn't make it to the top layer of skin during development. Here are two examples of Mongolian spots. As you can see, they have the coloring of a bruise, so one can easily be misled and think these indicate child abuse. To tell the difference between a Mongolian spot and an abusive bruise, pay close attention to the patterns, which we discussed on the previous slide. Another physical clue for physical abuse is fractures. Now, not all fractures are an indication of child abuse, but there's certain red flags that you need to be aware of. For example, if there are adjacent rib fractures, if you see these in infants, it's suggestive of abuse, as though the child's rib cage was being compressed by an adult's hands. So there's adjacent rib fractures. The second red flag is seeing multiple fractures at different stages of healing. Now there's a condition called osteogenesis imperfecta, and in that condition, children break their bones easily and frequently. 
to tell the difference between fractures related to osteogenesis imperfecta and physical abuse fractures, you just need to speak with the parents, obtain a really good history and physical exam, and in your workup, try to clarify exactly what caused the fracture. And during that history, you can usually figure it out. Lastly, physical clues may come in the form of subdural hematomas, retinal detachment, or retinal hemorrhages. And all three of these, subdural hematomas, retinal detachments, and retinal hemorrhages are all signs of abusive head trauma. To help you visualize this better, you can notice that this left image demonstrates a subdural hematoma. You can see a collection of blood in here with those arrows pointing to it. That's blood in the subdural space. And this right image shows retinal hemorrhages. You can see little collections of blood or hemorrhages from the retinal vasculature. And these retinal hemorrhages most often result from baby shaking or shaken baby syndrome. Now there are historical clues which can indicate physical abuse. For example, unexplained injuries. Or even if a caregiver explains an injury, but it doesn't make sense based on the patient's age, which leads us to age-inappropriate injuries. Those are historical clues of physical abuse. A good example of this is a caregiver saying that their two-month-old was climbing on the table and then fell off. A two-month-old wouldn't be climbing on any table. They're not able to. They can't even crawl. So that's an age-inappropriate injury. The caregiver may even deny an injury, even though the injury is obvious to you as a clinician. You can see it. And finally, a child may be injured, but the caregiver delays bringing in the child to get looked at. Most parents, if their child got hurt, would bring their child in right away. But parents who are abusive often put this off due to embarrassment or fear. So if the caregiver delays seeking care, then that's a red flag. When it comes to physical abuse, the abuser is most often the biological mother or the primary caregiver. And the victims are most often infants, so children less than one year old. Now let's talk about sexual abuse. In cases of sexual abuse, physical signs may actually be absent. However, patients may have an STI, which is a huge red flag, or even UTIs. Either of these can raise suspicion for sexual abuse, and STIs especially, because you can't get a sexually transmitted infection unless you engage in sex. Lastly, any trauma to the oral, anal, or genital regions is indicative of sexual abuse. Another red flag for sexual abuse can be gathered from the history. For example, if the child has inappropriate sexual behavior or knowledge based on their age. In other words, they know too much or if they've done too much. You think, a four-year-old should never know that or should not have done that. And the abusers or perpetrators of sexual abuse are most likely to be a trusted adult male, not necessarily a stranger. Now let's talk about the victims and epidemiology. Victims are most commonly prepubescent girls between the ages of 9 and 12, and they're at very high risk of developing PTSD, depression, and suicidality. Thus, adequate initial care and follow-up are vital to positive long-term outcomes. Now let's talk about emotional abuse. Just to give you an idea of what we're actually dealing with here, emotional abuse is defined as the degrading of a child's self-esteem or emotional well-being. This can be verbal or behavioral, and it can involve constant criticism, intimidation, withholding affection, humiliation, refusing to communicate, belittling, which is kind of like criticism and intimidation, berating, and even rejecting or isolating a child. So you can imagine that emotional abuse can have significant effects on the child. However, physical clues are often absent because it's an emotional psychological abuse. So in these cases, looking for historical clues are your best tool. So when examining the child, if you see that the child avoids their caretaker, that's a sign of emotional abuse. Or the patient may be clingy or attached readily to strangers. They may even be prone to emotional outbursts and aggression. And they can have vague or unexplained somatic symptoms, like their belly aching all the time or just being tired, nauseous, stuff like that. Now, the abusers are often the parent or caregiver. And in children who receive emotional abuse, there can be psychiatric illness, a delay in social and emotional and developmental skills. So we just covered child abuse using that large table with those details. Now let's talk about child neglect. Child neglect is the most common form of child abuse. But just remember that we categorize child neglect separate from child abuse, even though technically this is abuse of the child. Just categorize in your head child abuse is everything on that table, and everything we're now going to discuss is child neglect. So the point is, is that child neglect is the most common, even more common than anything we discussed on that table regarding child abuse. 
and child neglect is defined as a failure to provide adequate shelter, food, education, supervision, affection, and medical or dental care. So the presentation or evidence of neglect can range anywhere from some physical issue like malnutrition or the child just doesn't look well taken care of, like poor hygiene or something like that, all the way to simply psychosocial deficits. So we just mentioned that with child neglect, there can be a neglect of affection. So what's the difference between child neglect and infant deprivation of affection? Well, child neglect deals with children of any age, and it's the failure to provide them with necessary components of a functional life, which include shelter, food, affection, education, and supervision. Whereas infant deprivation deals specifically with infants, so less than one year old. And in infant deprivation of affection, you're dealing with only affection. Now the effects of infant deprivation of affection and child neglect are very similar. For example, they can both have poor growth, poor psychosocial development, and trust, so if we're just dealing with affection in either circumstance, you can tell the difference by seeing that infant deprivation of affection has to happen really early. So the difference is the age. If you're dealing with exclusively lack of affection and they're less than a year old, then you think infant deprivation of affection. Realistically, with child neglect, usually lack of affection is associated with lack of food, shelter, education, and supervision. It's usually not in isolation, so it's unlikely that you would get them confused. Now let's discuss vulnerable child syndrome. Now, vulnerable child syndrome is the opposite of child neglect. It's characterized by overprotective parenting. I'll help you understand why this overprotective parenting can be a problem. But first, let's identify the risk factors. If there's ever a serious illness or a near-death experience of the child, that can lead to overprotective parenting. Often, the parent's heightened level of worry regarding their child's risk of getting sick or injured can result in the overuse of medical services and even miss school. So basically, the parent overcorrected. They weren't neglectful, but they still harmed their child. Now that we've covered all four of these conditions, let's review with a question. An 11-year-old girl living with her mother and aunt comes into the office due to bad stomach aches. She says that they have been going on for over a month now and it hurts to urinate. She is timid and avoids eye contact with the physician. During the interview, the mom states that they live alone, but that both she and her sister have boyfriends that frequently spend the night. Your analysis is performed and white blood cell counts are within normal ranges. What is an appropriate next step in treating the child? Hopefully from the question stem, you notice that this young girl is at risk of getting sexually abused. For example, she's 11 years old, which is between that 9 to 12 year old range. And there are two boyfriends that visit her mother and her aunt. So male adult acquaintances. And there are some social problems. And we also have evidence of somatic symptoms with those bad stomach aches. And the fact that it hurts to urinate is also a red flag for some potential sexual trauma. Plus, the girl is timid and avoids eye contact with the physician. So with this constellation of findings, what's the appropriate next step? That would be A, assess for an STI. B is incorrect because the urinalysis was already performed, which makes UTIs unlikely. So a urine culture wouldn't be very informative. Now C is incorrect because interviewing the parent alone isn't standard procedure in cases of suspected abuse. However, interviewing the child alone may be appropriate since abused children will often not disclose abuse during the interview with the parent in the room. D is incorrect because a skeletal survey is really only indicated in cases of suspected physical abuse because it scans all the bones of the body for fractures, but we don't have any red flags for physical abuse. Lastly, choice E is wrong because this girl doesn't have any signs or symptoms of drug use or poisoning, so a toxicology screen wouldn't fit here. And that concludes this section.